the success you will feel from the person going from 10,000 to 30,000 is near identical to from 100,000 to a half million. It's the same right. kinds of feelings you're going to feel and you'll be contributing to that. So that, and again, that's why I think people get into entrepreneurship is the idea of building and growing and pivoting. And it's interesting. Every day is different. Throws all yeah. kinds of, there's very little routine about a business and running a business. Right. And that's attractive, but it also, it's also very stressful. Right? That's the, the collateral damage in that. Yeah, there's no rules and there's no roadmap, which on the one hand is like so freeing. And then on other days, you're like, could someone just tell me what to do? I will do anything. Just tell me what to do. And there's no there's not always a clear answer for that. And so, like you say, it's a double edged sword. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to The Joyous Path to Millions with me, your host, Emily June Wilcox, money healer and business mentor. I am joined today by a friend of mine, Peter Bush, who was a judge on kind of an entrepreneur reality TV show. So we had an experience filming together back in January. No, the show is not out yet. (laughs) We will let you know. I will tell you when the show airs, but probably one of the most enjoyable parts for me was getting to know the other judges who are volunteering their time and wanting to mentor other entrepreneurs and have been very successful business owners in their own right. And one of the things that stood out for me about Peter is that you just have such a heart for entrepreneurs. And I think you have a really gentle coaching style, which honestly is like so refreshing to see in a man where I just find that so many men want to just come into the room and be in the spotlight and have an ego and show how much they know. And I think you have a very humble, disarming approach. It's very questions based and you're really wanting to get to what is it that makes this entrepreneur tick? What is it that's special about their business? Where are they stuck? And I think you have a very masterful way of doing that. And so I'm really excited to have you on the show and have you share some of your expertise here. So thank you and welcome. Thank you. No, I appreciate the kind words. And I, I think I, I don't know, I've had that temperament for a while and, and it's served me well in my career. And now it's transitioning into more of this mentorship, all the wisdom I've got, right? I've learned how not to do things. That's why you want to talk to me. But it's been an interesting journey, and I would say my path to entrepreneurship was atypical, and I think that's something that resonates with me, and that I have this wisdom, and I started talking to people and realizing, oh, wow, their paths are very different than mine, but they ran, they're encountering all the same problems I went through. So let's catch everybody up to speed. What has your path to entrepreneurship been? My first dose of it was with my father, and when I was in college, I was going to school for new media, which at the time was like 3D animation and web design, and I made an interactive CD-ROM on the battle of Shiloh and the Civil War with my dad because he's a big historian and I knew how to like animate. And so we created this like software to teach kids and whoever about how this battle was fought. And ultimately the business failed. Like we, he put you know a ton of his own money into it, didn't have that money to put into it, but he believed what he had was something that people would want. And we just missed on how to market it, bringing it to market. And, and ultimately it was a failure. And I didn't really get back into it till later in my career, but I started off out of college into the animation industry. So I worked in 2D and 3D animation, got to work on the SpongeBob SquarePants movie, which is just a hell of a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. It was just incredible to meet all those people and the, and the talent. And Steve, the, the founder of, of SpongeBob, I, I got to scan in the original post-it note that SpongeBob was drawn on. And I was a kid, I didn't know what that was. But so then I got into 3D animation and then ultimately worked at a company that had this technology to help basically animate faces faster. It was really niche, but like in entertainment, you tell your stories through the faces. So whether it's a video game or an animated movie or something like that, but they were offering it as a service. So people would have to pay just for them to animate faces, which was like this very niche thing that didn't scale. And I worked there for, it was about three or four years before it just wasn't working. They burned through 13, 14 salespeople. They kept firing people because nobody knew how to sell it. And so I said, there's got to be a better way. And which was that entrepreneur store. There's a problem and there should be a solution. So I put together a business plan. Didn't know how to create a business plan. The internet taught me that. And I I put together a 13 page business plan, sent it to my CEO and he went through and he's like, yeah, this is great. Cause he was trying to solve the problem of how do we scale this thing? How do we bring in sustained revenue? And then served up on a platter was this plan. And I was saying, Hey, look, I'll do the work. Like this seems interesting to me. And here's the four or five people we should bring along with us. And so he went to the board and basically said, yeah, let's do that. So we spun out a company from this larger company with that plan in mind. So we had four or five people. They gave us, it was like five, $600,000 loan, which was just to give us a runway to get going. 
which wasn't very yeah. much. I mean, that with our salaries and all of our overhead and everything, that gave us about seven months from when we started, and which puts a fire under you. It was basically like we got our funding round, we had a plan, but we started with we had cash. We had product because we were basically turning what was a service into software. And then we had clients because people were paying for our services. So we had a huge head start, but that wasn't going to be enough to sustain and grow. And so we had to, we pivoted our business model a couple different times. And, and then we scaled that software company to 90 countries around the world. And we had about 4,000 customers and about 200 enterprise accounts because there's so many people that tell stories with faces in entertainment. And so we had a really successful run. I'd say I'd learned a lot of that sort of 12 years of building up that business was learning how not to do things. And that's where all this mm. wisdom comes in. And then ultimately the business got sold in, in April of 2021 to a new ownership group. And then I stayed on for about a year to help complete that transaction and then set my sights on what was next. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting is being able to be a mentor to startups and joining a VC firm or something where I could get a lot of exposure to helping startups because I enjoyed that. I helped. I love talking about the problems people have and the solutions and the different approaches you can take and like, how do you build up your team and how do you go to market and how do you price your things and like all these things that are that I lived firsthand. I just found pe most people in the startup world are very under-resourced and yeah. they just don't have, they don't even have the ability to talk about those things because they don't have anybody else in their circle that even knows what they're talking about. And so- right. To just have a conversation, hey, let's talk about your business. Like, why did you price it the way you did? All of these conversations become really interesting really quickly for me because I just geek out on this stuff. Mm -hmm. But I would say that whole path to me selling our, we sold our company was not that traditional startup path. I fully know that. And I appreciate it now more than ever of what we had back yeah. in 2012 was a gift. And I still think we yeah. underperformed. So I love it because it's an example of all the different ways that entrepreneurship is possible. And like you said, in a way, it was almost like you had raised your first round of fundraising, except you didn't have to go out and do a bunch of pitches. You had the money. But also, as you and I were talking about before we hit record, it doesn't take away the pressure, the need to perform. And in a way, when you start out with six to 700K invested into the company, it's like, the threshold for success is just higher now, too. Whereas if you're starting this out of your garage, you might be like, if I could just get this to $5,000 a month where it pays my basic expenses, I'm thrilled. And I suspect that you guys went into this, okay, this thing needs to do several million dollars within X amount of time in order for this to be even viable, right? It was like I had such a fundamental misunderstanding of how investment works. Like my goal was like, how do I give them back their six hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, right? And like, how do I generate enough revenue where we have six hundred thousand dollars profit to literally give back to the investors? And that's not what you're trying to what they're investing in. And it took me probably six yeah. years into that journey to realize they're actually just looking for a return on the investment. They could have put that money in a savings account and instead right. they just need a percentage return on that 600,000. And like, it sounds obvious to me now, but I, like when I went on it, I just looked at it as, okay, that's how much money we got in the bank to pay our salaries to build something bigger. I didn't quite right. know what that meant, but I did know we have to build a sustainable business. And what I mean by that, like, I think like repeatable, right? That just and I think a lot of people like it goes to things like pricing and the money side of things, right? I'm like, I know what I was making money wise when I was working before we spun the company out. But when you're in that founder position, you're closest to the money that's coming in. And so when I say you're close to it, like you're driving that story, you're driving your own job security, you're driving your own salary, because the more successful you are, the more you're going to be able to bring in and provide. Ultimately, what I love about running a business is you're providing for all of your employees, all their families, all of your customers. Like it's this really massive give back. Now it comes with a lot of baggage, but the big win is being able to provide all that back. And it's, it just becomes this really fulfilling thing. And so the repeatability to me is what a lot of people lose sight of in that fundamentally your business solves a problem. Who has that problem? And what are they paying? A big question is like, what are they paying currently to solve that problem? If your business yeah. doesn't exist, because that's actually where you assess value and repeatability is how much, okay, they're solving it somehow, right? Which right. could be two or three different things, or they're buying this inferior product or whatever it is. They're placing value on that problem by how much money they're paying for it, right. which gives you a sense of like how much you should charge for it. And it just becomes this really interesting way to look at like, how do I build a repeatable model that then, right. because I understand how much value they're putting on it. So if they're paying $100 for the widget, okay, how many people have that problem? Okay, there's 10,000 people that have that problem. Will they have that problem every year? 
every month so you understand how does it scale over time because so, time's right. one of the biggest things people don't really think about is one of the biggest factors you need to plan for is you have to have repeatability and customers coming back you either have the same customers coming back and paying you money or you get new customers yeah i liked your point too about how that first 600k in your mind you were almost treating it i think like personal debt mm -hmm. like the way that we're taught to handle personal debt is pay it off as soon as possible it's bad yeah. and so you're like great how can i like quickly get this money back to them and like you said they weren't looking at it that way they were look at looking at it like if we have this money to play with are we putting it in a high yield savings account are we investing it into our current business model are we investing it somewhere else and how much money will that money make us and if you're on a growth trajectory they're not in any hurry to get the 600k back out they want it to stay in so 100%. that their return they're, gets bigger that's the investment it just sounds so obvious now and what we ended up doing is we paid i, I think it was like 60k a year we paid 10 percent basically and we factored that 60k just into our budgets yeah so we knew every year we're going to pay them back 10% on their money, so they're happy. But ultimately, yep. they want some multiple return on 600K, which they got 12 years later, but they also got 10% on that money every year until right. the 12th year when we finally yeah. sold. And it's one of those things, if I would have known that going in, I probably would have taken a very different path in those first five years. How so? I, I just, <laughs> it was live and learn, right? We made decisions in our first five years that ultimately capped our success 12 years later because the way in which we priced our product, it's one of those things you can't, unless you significantly change the value proposition, you can't go up. Mm. And so we were charging like a software license per seat, per user. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, whatever that number is, is an incremental number. And when you're a B2B model, we should have been charging a studio fee. So everybody in their studio should use our software, not just one or two people, because people are generally cheap. And because we had this really set a precedent that we charge X dollars per seat is thousands of dollars, but that doesn't scale as much as if we charged a hundred thousand dollars per studio, right? For the same number of customers, right? So yeah. if you're charging yeah. two thousand dollars per studio, and they have two people, so we're making four thousand dollars per studio, and we get a hundred studios, is very different than we charge a hundred thousand dollars studio and we get. 20 studios right. and like just the basic financial mechanics of it. We just got wrong in the first five years, really wrong to the point when we sold it, we should have sold for 10 X higher. Mm. If I had to go, go and you had an eight figure exit as it was, right? Yeah, it was, a, it was a mid eight figure exit, which was great. But my first point on the heels of that, it should have been a nine figure exit easily. Right. Like, yeah, I know what it yeah. should have been just because I've lived yeah. in that market for so long and what actually was the potential there. And other businesses in our space that got acquired. Yeah. So we're very happy. I'm not going to seem ungrateful, but it's just like right. lessons learned. And I think that's maybe that's driving why I want to give back and teach entrepreneurs about that, about how right. when you're in those early stages. Here's the other thing I want to tap into is this imposter syndrome. Like I never felt that in the business because I guess I didn't feel like an entrepreneur. So I never was plagued with that. But I, when I talk to these business owners and they just, a lot of people just they can't get out of their own way. Yeah. They just get in their head. They get too many committee meetings. And ultimately, I think the bigger challenge, they don't have other people to talk to about these things or other people having success and their success stories all over the place. But there's so many failure stories that don't get talked about. But to me, like most people can run a business, right? But when they're in their business, they generally usually represent their customers or very close to that. And so you're not an imposter. You're exactly who you are. And what you lack might be the wisdom but then you got to tap into that. But most people are not, when you really dive into it, they're just in their own head because they want to do it to some level of perfection or I, I don't know, like I, the, people have all kinds of reasons why they don't do something, but I'm a massive overbeliever now. And even now more so because the company I've joined is, is on a massive trajectory and it's all this give back. But I just think it's a travesty that so many people don't feel like they belong in these spaces and they should. They're just... Yeah. You really talk to us. I know you know exactly what you're talking about. You understand your customer. You empathize with your customer. Who else would I buy from? Yeah, certainly the reason that I'm so passionate about business mentorship, like hiring a coach or putting yourself in a mastermind, like masterminds traditionally are my favorite thing to invest in. And it's probably my favorite container that I hold in my business because it just accelerates everything all at once where it's you're saying the thing you were scared to say this. Who am I? Can I do this? I don't know. Can I charge this much? Do I really know what I'm doing? And when you're brave enough to say it in front of others, then it's, oh yeah, me too. Oh, I felt that way also. And by the way, here's what I see in you. 
And it's one thing when your coach that you're paying says that, but it's also another thing when other entrepreneurs are really holding up the mirror and letting you see how capable you are and how much further along you you are than you think. And even your story about the pricing and how you guys got that wrong, I'm like, I actually don't think I know any entrepreneurs that if they could go back in time, wouldn't change their pricing. Like, oh, it's, like it's, it's just like it's, when you start, you're like, oh my gosh, yes, people are paying for this. Yeah. People are signing up. This is amazing. And usually you have the flexibility to change things over time. And it sounds maybe you guys didn't or chose not to, but I do think that's like part of it too. I just don't know that many people that come out hot with like really premium pricing and absolutely nail it right out the gates. They don't. You're your best bet is if you're in an industry that's commoditized, there's other people doing what you're doing because maybe there's right. some precedent set that you can look to as a guiding light, right? What do other yeah. people pay for the same kind of thing? Then you should be confident, right? If it's some sort of service that other people offer, what do they, what does the market offer for this kind of service? That's where they value right. it. Then you have a hell of a lot more confidence than. I always try to use the example, how much does time travel cost? I have no idea. What would you pay for that? I don't know. There's a lot of businesses that I think are trying to offer new services or a new look on something. And I've done a ton of pricing work. And one of the biggest things is what does it feel like it should cost? Which is like a subjective thing, but you're going to come up with a number. And that's ultimately where we set our pricing. When we revised our pricing to something that actually stuck, it was what we felt people would pay. And as soon as we started pitching it with confidence, people like, yep, I'll pay that. Yeah, It makes sense. I get business to business a little different than direct to consumer, but it's still like going with your gut is probably the best way to start, you know, just. Yeah, it's still the same thing. Yeah. And I think often what happens is then over time, your clients teach you what the real value is in what you're doing, whether it's a service or software or a product. It's like you think it's solving one thing, but it may be solving something different. Or it's this thing and these three other things that you weren't thinking about. And then all of a sudden that totally changes the value proposition. But it's just hard to anticipate all of that at the beginning. You you just don't. You just got to get going, right? You got to get somewhere to get market feedback and build some level of customer base. Because then like the plan I put together for for Flawless, like in my mind, I've mapped out six years of growth, two years of traction, two years of revolution, and two years of domination. And it's because... The traction phase, like you just don't know. You don't know the market. You don't know your customers like you do, right? You learn so much in those first couple of years. The growth phase is you grow two ways. You either grow by adding more customers or you grow within the customers you already have, meaning what other products and services can I sell to those existing customers? I don't have to acquire them again. They're already buying something from me. What else would they buy from me? And it's a hell of a lot easier to sell somebody the blue crayon when they already bought the red crayon, right? Yeah. But sometimes that's not possible based on what lane you're in. So then it's how do I get more customers to sell the blue crayon to? Because that's all I got. But you can grow or do both, which is this dominant strategy of being able to add more customers, add more complementary products and services to what you already have. And then it's this like accelerant to get to domination where you then start owning a category or owning a market or something like that. Yeah. That's when I talk about time. It's planning those moves out. Knowing that if you're going to have some level of success over the next two years, two years from now, how many customers should you have? Okay, if you had 100 customers right now, what would you sell to them? The same stuff or more stuff, right? And then that kind of where strategy comes into play is I need to get to 100 customers. And then when I get 100 customers, I'm going to add this second thing. But I don't need to think about the second thing for at least two years because I got to get I got to spend the next two years getting to that 100 customers. So it's like this idea of using time in favor So that you don't have to do everything all at once, which is that entrepreneur's curse is everybody wants everything I'm ever going to say. And no, you got to start simple, start to build some traction and scale and then switch those things on when you're ready to and you have the right resources. And it's it takes a lot of discipline, but that's the the best path to go easy on yourself. Having gone through that. Absolutely. And like we've talked about, put yourself in a space where someone will ask you these questions. Is this a now problem? Is this when do you need to add that service? And That's so helpful because if we're just in our own heads, we will make entrepreneurship harder than it needs to be. It's that curse, right? Of knowing too much about the problem you solve and being very passionate, especially when you start getting success, right? It's validation, but you have to moderate that, right? You can't get overzealous and do too much because people simply don't care about your problem as much as you do. And that also goes for like the own, your own people that you hire. I see a lot of people talk about their people hiring strategy and people problems. And the reality is, is your founding group they're all drinking the Kool-Aid, right? They're the ones that are all in. They were there at the start. They're the most passionate. They should be the most loyal. You're not going to keep them forever. 
but they're the ones that sort of should all get it. And then the next level down are sort of the generals, your men and women that they joined at a good time. They're responsible for a big chunk of the business or a big department. They like half drink the Kool-Aid. They're there for a check. They don't quite get the full, you know, equity or they don't get the full thing, but they're really in because they're like, this is a great opportunity. I'm in a senior position and you get them for a few years. And then the level down is worker bees and the worker bees don't care. They just don't. You're going to expect they don't care. They're going to get a paycheck. At best, you create a really good culture for them to be a part of. And then they want to contribute. Maybe they want to aspire to go to that sort of middle level. But it's it was a big realization for me, having gone through it, that there's, I would assume as a founder, I was so passionate that everybody would want the same passion right. I have. And they just yeah. don't. Is this big revealing moment. It's like, oh, and we lost one of our key employees about six years in. And I she left. And she went to a company that I thought was inferior. And mm-hmm. I like took personal offense to that. I was like, why would you go there? I know how they make decisions. Like their leadership group's really terrible. And it was revealing to me that not everyone is in your company for the same reasons. Right. Which again, sounds obvious. Yeah. But it did until I went through that, it, yeah. it wasn't like this really powerful thing that affected me that I really realized, no, I got you just got to create a, a culture that people want to be a part of. And at best, yeah. you just breed loyalty within, say, a five to seven year run. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think it's like a lot of it is around expectation setting. The other thing I'll say, I've seen it where some of my clients are not the highest paid person on their team. And I'm like, listen, Is anyone else on your team stressed about making payroll? Is anyone else on your team like worried if you guys drop a client? Do they even think about the cash flow to the business? Are they concerned about where cuts have to be made? And it's if the answer is no, which it is for 99% of people, like maybe if you have a CFO on your team, they're concerned about that. But unless you've got a C-suite, you're the only one. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to carry the stress of the entire business, then you better be the best paid on the team. And so anyway, it's a little bit of a, a rabbit hole, but I think it's important because I just see, again, I think especially with women, there's a tendency to give everyone else what they need and not prioritize what you need. And It's yes, there should be a fair exchange, but for these employees on your team, it's a very different relationship to the business than what your relationship is. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay for employees to have an employee mindset, but it's much more transactional for them. And they are not staying up at night stressed about the same things that you're stressed about. Yeah, they're not. And I, and sometimes you get people that are worth more than you to the business. Yeah. Right. Which I know contradicts your point you just made, but it's like, I've had a couple of people ask me like, hey, I've had this person that's worked with me for five, 10 years and they plateaued where they're at salary wise. And if I give them another raise, they're going to make more than me. And I'm like, at some level, they might be more valuable. They might be contributing at a level more than you, right? Because they're motiv- yeah. they're differently motivated. What is that loyalty worth to you? If you lose them, it's like a pain factor. We always called it hit by right. bus factor. Right. Like you lose that person. What does that do to the value of that whole business? And what does it take to replace them? And some people are irreplaceable in businesses. And ultimately, where's your business headed? Are you trying to sell? And then in which case, if you have all the equity, you're going to participate there. And then that person, if they only have a fraction of that, the only way they make money is through their salary and how you're right. providing. So these get complex, right? Yeah. Years you get in business, but people undervalue themselves all the time. Businesses generally don't look at, and unless you're working for a major corporation, like most startups don't really look out for you and are constantly doing performance reviews and giving you pay increases. And it's not because they don't care. It's because they're, like you're saying, they're worried about payroll. They're worried about that next right. customer. They're worried about why that customer's pissed off. And there's a bunch of revenue that they need to protect. On the scale of list of things they worry about, like taking care of my employees, sadly, it falls down lower and lower on the list. And until you make it important, right, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. So when you had this mid eight figure exit, I mean, did that put you at a point where like in theory you could be set for life? You wouldn't have to work again? Or you felt like, no, I do need a next move. It wasn't what you'd think it would be. I'd say that in that there was a really nice payout with that didn't set me for life. It set me on a different trajectory, mostly because of the point I made earlier. It was great, but it should have been significant. It should have been that life generational yeah. changing money. And that's where I challenged myself. I was like, okay, I'm still see, at that point. I was late 30s, early 40s in that sort of transition period. So I got yeah, a lot of like working all years. All your like, best working years are ahead yeah, of you. Like, yeah. like my <laughs> most revenue generating years for me are in the next sort of 15 years. So right. what do I really want to do that to get to that as a business or as a career, call it. So it set me in a good place 
case that I had some cushion and comfort of what we need to do. And then I put that money to work and other investments and things like that. But it's in terms of what was next, right? Because it wasn't like ready to hang it up and go on a golf course. It was, yeah. where do I really want, where am I going to get the most fulfillment? And there was a couple different paths in my mind on what that looked like. So why did you end up at Flawless? I always had in my mind, like you work for a company for so long. I always had in my mind my first five phone calls. If I was fed up and I was ready to quit at any point during those 16 years, like who were my first five phone calls to go look? And I had that list. So when I finally stayed on it for about a roughly a year after we sold, I reached out to did my feelers. And it, there was a big mental switch for me of I'm going to go start looking for something else. I'm literally going to I'm done with this. I, I, the whole equity st- structure changed and all of that. And basically one of the companies that worked with the Faceware, the animation company that, that we sold, they were in early talks. I don't know if they were an early investor in Flawless, but Flawless had been around for about four years. And what was fascinating, I think, was Faceware, the company I was at for 17 years, was founded by two Brits from Manchester and then the, in the entertainment industry. And then they set up shop in Santa Monica, California to break into Hollywood and expand what they were doing. Flawless, separate company, founded by two Brits from Manchester who (laughs) made technology to impact the entertainment industry, set up shop in Santa Monica to impact Hollywood. So I felt like it was 15 years. It was my same career path, but 15 years rewind. So I have all this wisdom Mm. of how not to do it, I'll say. That's why I told the founders of Flawless, like, you guys are going to hire me because of all the reasons that I've failed, not because of my successes. Because I have successes, but all the reasons I've learned how not to do things and all the pricing and hiring and go to market and all the things like there's just a clear path for me because we were operating in the same space. They're just at a much different scale. And so what's great about it is they just to interrupt for a second, yep. when you're saying they're at a much different scale, give us some examples of what that scale looks yeah. like. Yeah. So Flawless has this technology that can make it's like deep fake technology, but it basically we can make on screen actors appear as if they're speaking foreign dialogue. So right now when you have an English TV show or film, the way to get it into other foreign markets is through dubbing. And that's just yeah. changing the audio out and then you or subtitles. What they do is actually have technology to make the on-screen actors appear as if they're speaking Japanese or Korean or French. Mm-hmm. But you don't have to shoot your movie in a different way with new technology. So it applies to every piece of content ever created. So we can yeah. take massive potential. And then it's a matter of getting to the right studios and getting to the right localization houses that do the dubbing work. And networking all all of this together and making sure that the technology is robust and it scales and it has the right quality level. So you have to work at Ultra HD, which is for like IMAX films and color spaces. So when I say it's a different scale, the problem they solve, which is like a fix for film dubbing, that's pretty identifiable. But where it applies across an entire entertainment industry globally is where it's at a scale that's just, it's amazing. And so it it just... How many people do you guys employee? So I was employee 62 a little over a year ago, and we're at 130 at the moment. We'll be a few hundred in the years to come. And so I joined the C-suite, about six of us, seven seven C-suite people in various roles, all with 15, 20 years experience in their own lanes. Yeah. What was interesting is I joined Flawless, and I had not worked with anybody in Flawless. I didn't have Mm. that familiar relationship. And so it's really, and a lot of people join Flawless in similar regards. So you end up creating this. It's one of these things I would say as an advice to founders, which is really interesting is a lot of people result to hiring their friends and who they know. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen with Flawless is we hired people that we didn't know. We hired them for the right skills, for the right job and the right role. And what it actually created is this really interesting environment where everybody shows up to work, to perform because nobody has any track record. So you create this really interesting dynamic and it's really positive culture from the top down of we're all creating this new, exciting, thing. That's why I think startups are infectious is because you're solving a problem and you're building something together as a team and you're getting yeah. validation in the market. And But when you're doing that with people you're just getting to know at the same time, it's just another interesting wrinkle, but it's actually created a really strong culture of accountability. Because if I show up and people can look at my resume or whatnot and think, oh, that's, that, that looks really good, but it's only good on paper until I start working. And it's, what are you doing yeah. for us? How do you perform? How do you scale? How do you contribute? And it, startups are all about that. Right. How do you put the right team together to execute a plan? And you need to make sure you have a pretty diverse set of perspectives, a diverse set of skills and diverse set of roles to scale any business. And it's what we're doing at at this huge multi-billion dollar scale, scaled down to a company that's just trying to be a lifestyle business. And that's where I guess my temperament, one of your earlier comments is I don't want when people talk to me to be intimidated that I'm this big ultra successful thing. It's not that like I think businesses at any scale have the same problems. 
and they're, you know, they're, when you humanize those problems and say, well, how many people do you have? Where are you at in your business? Are you doing it part-time? Are you doing it full-time? Like all of those things, like at what point do you want to go full-time? How much money do you need to make for you to pay your bills and, and have that cushion and be comfortable so you're not stressed out? Like it's already stressful enough just to run a business, let alone it's your core source of providing for who you are. I've been able to talk to people and just have these very real conversations because those are the things that you actually need to talk about and be able to have some like entrepreneur therapy for. Yeah, so totally. It's so va- like people are just like, they just don't talk, they either talk about it with their significant other. And if their significant other isn't in the startup world, then it, everything just seems like risk and like, why the hell are you doing this? This isn't providing, it's just stressing you out. You're not making enough money. And no, it's not that, right? It's the idea that startup to me is you're creating something, you're solving a problem and it's validating because it was your idea and it's you yeah. executing it. And I think that's huge explosion of growth in like female and women owned businesses and founders because I yeah. think they're really empathetic by yeah. nature. And so they, that's what a good business needs, right? You got to be empathetic to your customers and to your employees. And yeah. clearly there's a big problem with males not doing that. I've just seen it in my career and can't get out of their own way for egos and other reasons. But it's a fascinating community to study. And after you've gone through it, you realize there's a common bond there right. and, and things, those things resonate and you'll be able to make these connections. That's what I've really enjoyed about talking about all different businesses from brick and mortar to services to AI is just across the board. They're all the same kinds of problems. Yeah, I love that. And it is so fascinating that there's somebody with your personality where it's, I have to talk to you for 50 minutes before you'll tell me like, yeah, at the multi-billion dollar scale, this is what we're doing. And then one of the things you and I learned as judges is that we really had to ask the contestants, are you full-time or part-time in your business? What was your annual revenue last year? Do you have anybody on your team? So that we could actually give good coaching yeah. because you couldn't necessarily figure that out based on posturing because some people were really good at making their business seem very big and established and polished because they were just polished public speakers and they had a good elevator pitch. and we'd find ourselves giving coaching that didn't apply at all. Yeah. And other people, it's like this real humble kind of a vibe. You think they don't have a lot going on and then you're like, oh, wait, sorry, this is a seven-figure business? Oh, okay, you've got this many people on your team. And in just like a few answers, you're like, okay, you are in a very different position yeah. Then the, and so I'm going to give you very different type of advice. And success is relative, right? If you're making a thousand bucks to get to ten thousand, you're ten x what you were. Let's figure out a path to that. Let's baby steps. Not everything's going to get to a million bucks, and that's fine. Right. If you're that's trying right. to create a business to sustain three or four people's livelihoods, just to that, which is totally fine. That's super successful. That's where the numbers. I've loved your approach on being very transparent about revenue and numbers because of that. Because success is relative. And yeah, my, I've only generated ten thousand dollars this year. Okay, nothing to right. be ashamed of. Okay, how do you get to 30,000? Or if they generated right. 100,000, I'm like, okay, how do you get to half million? How do you get to a million? Let's just, let's put it in the, through the lens of where you're at now and where you're trying to go. Right. Because that will see the success you will feel from the person going from 10,000 to 30,000 is near identical to from 100,000 to a half million. It's the same right. kinds of feelings you're going to feel and you'll be contributing to that. So that, and again, that's why I think people get into entrepreneurship is the idea of building and growing and pivoting. And it's interesting every day days different throws all yeah. kinds of there's very little routine about a business and running a business right and that's attractive but it all it's also very stressful right? that's the the collateral damage in that yeah there's no rules and there's no roadmap which on the one hand is like so freeing and then on other days you're like could someone just tell me what to do i will do anything just tell me what to do and there's no there's not always a clear answer for that and so like you say it's a double-edged sword it is. And I've talked to a few people that, I'll be honest, they shouldn't be entrepreneurs. They just didn't do well with the anxiety of yeah. that pressure, right? They were really, I think there's an attraction to, you see a show like Shark Tank, right? Which is like inspired plenty of people to get into business, but then you see how many businesses fail because that stress gets too overwhelming, especially when you have a family, right? I know like I didn't start to have it. My son's five. So what all the stuff and all the growth and all the mistakes we were making at Facewear, there was just less stakes. Failure was losing my job. Okay, I'll go work for another studio. But when you're providing yeah. for a wife and son, you just have a very different risk tolerance. And these are just all the realities and the discussions that you need to have. Is this business sustainable? Yeah. And are you feeling comfortable enough to do it? And I think a lot of people are capable. They have that imposter syndrome and they get it. They just need some confidence boost or they're 
They're not good with numbers. Okay, then bolster that somehow. Find a fractional CFO or something. Don't try to be the numbers person if you're not the numbers person. It's one of those things. Do you think that for some of the entrepreneurs you've interacted with, that they could they could be best served perhaps finding an employer that is a startup and fosters an entrepreneurial culture similar to the experience that you had? Yeah, I 100%. I recommend, look, if you're in a place in life where you have a lot of risk tolerance, go join like a seed stage company, very early stage company that's super high risk, has no resources. They're just trying to figure it out. It's super scrappy and fun. If you're trying to get into that startup culture where you're building something, but you have a little bit more stability, go look at companies that have raised a series A because they've got enough capital coming in. They figured out product market market fit so they know that there's people buying what they're selling and but they're still in a growth phase so you still tap into that culture they probably have a half decent benefits package because they got to get good people but be very deliberate and look for companies in that stage they've been around for two three years so all that risk goes out the door and try to go from series a to series b and it's something i I don't hear talked about a lot if you want to get into startup culture i think the impression is you're going bootstrap right to the bottom as well Startups have a five-year cycle before they become a company or a corporation. So just look at it through a different lens and look in the fields you want to get into that are interesting. There are startups yeah. in every business, in every industry. Yeah. You might have to travel, but like you, there's opportunity there. And those companies are just as fun to work for as the bootstrap ones that are super scrappy and super yeah. validating. You might not be in that founding membership group, but you could be in that second level down that I'm talking about where you have huge impact, you have stability. You get a hopefully autonomy over your own domain. That is also entrepreneurial and scratches that right. itch and is massively validating. I've had people ask me, like, what should I do if this business doesn't work? And so you've learned a ton. And right. There's nothing about what you've gone through that should be seen as a failure. Those are all lessons learned that if you go and then talk to that Series A company going in saying, hey, my last company just didn't work for these reasons. I feel like you guys might have some of the similar problems that I went through. I'd love to contribute to a much bigger way. I just need a little bit of stability in my life. Yep. And that's fine. If you're interviewing me and being that transparent, I'm like, come aboard. We're going to go figure this out. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Great advice. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I have a feeling that people listening will want to connect with you. What's the best way to do that? LinkedIn's probably the best best way. I'm on social, but I've had to do several purges over the years to, to, <laughs> to just people that, that I didn't really have that tight relationship with. But LinkedIn. I'm like, tell me more. Is there drama behind the social media drama. purges? There was just like the social media companies are, are the worst. At, sometimes they'll say, hey, do you want to connect to every single person you've ever talked to? My right. network would get to thousands of people. I'm like, I don't care about how these people. Now I'm not even seeing updates yeah. from my family. Right. But LinkedIn, Peter Bush. You'll see me. I work for a company called Flawless. Please link him to me. Please reach out to me. That's probably the best way to get a hold of me. I I could talk for another hour or two on this stuff. So hopefully this yeah. was, hopefully this is productive. I love geeking out on this on these subjects. Yeah, me too. No, this was super great. We'll make sure that your LinkedIn URL is in the show notes as well. Final question: What does it look like or feel like for you to be on the joyous path to millions? What does it look like or feel like to be on here? Yeah. Not on the show, but like on your own joyous path to Uh, millions. Sorry. That's the fun part of life to me. Like, And again, why you get an entrepreneurship is you're steering your own ship. And I feel like, so I have a son now who's five and I'm like, this is a life I'm living is what I would want for him where he's on his own path. Mm. He's going to be able to provide for a family. He's going to be able to provide for himself first and foremost. But then it's that providing for more people, right? More people that work for a company that you work for, more customers, right? I mean, that to me, I'm doing it in in something in an area that I love. Uh, I love the entertainment. I love movies. Like I got into that industry for that reason. And so you put all that together that I'm building something to have impact in an industry that I deeply care about that has profound impact on the people that work for it and the people that are sort of getting the benefit of its products. That to me is what that feels like, which as a man is one of the, I think one of the foundational things at my core is a provider and feeling proud about that. And so doing that and being able to take all that energy home to my family and be there and show up for my wife and my son and be very present in their lives. And freedom is what you're ultimately striving for. And that's the goal, right? How do I get free of my time and being able to choose what I want to do and win? And that's, that is that joyous path. Money's money is a byproduct to help you give that, but no, it's, I got some choice in what I want to do today. Absolutely. I'm right there with you. Freedom is like a top core value for me. That's it. Yes. Financial freedom. 
but mostly time freedom. Time freedom. So, That's it. Oh. And like you say, freedom of choice so that we get to do the things that we care about. And yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Peter, for coming on the show. And to everyone listening, thank you so much for tuning in. Isn't that a nice deviation from our typical guest on the podcast, like a spiritual woman in a service-based business. I just love Peter. I like his energy a lot. He's a good human and he has such interesting experiences. And I feel a theme so far this year for me has been putting myself in different spaces. And so I've been going outside of my network bubble and meeting a lot of interesting people. And there's good people everywhere. And there are people everywhere who have really interesting business experiences, interesting takes on life. And I'm glad that Peter came on the show to just share his perspective, his energy and his expertise with us. So make sure that you connect with him on LinkedIn if you enjoyed this interview today. Here were my top takeaways. Number one, see a need and meet it. Fundamentally, that's what entrepreneurship is all about. And it actually doesn't matter if you're bootstrapping in your garage or if you are part of another company. It's like when you notice that there is a need in the marketplace, find a way to meet it. And that's exactly what Peter did. Number two, understand how business debt works. That was a fun little rabbit hole that we went down because I do see, of course, looking through my lens of money wounds, where many entrepreneurs take their preconceived notions about debt into their business. But business debt is different. And you've got to understand what you're dealing with, what you're playing with. If you've got investors or if you're getting an SBA loan or something like that, look at it differently. Look at it as how can this money be used to make more money instead of the personal finance lens of how do I pay this off as quickly as possible? Number three, know that most people have similar fears and struggles to you. So find a place to connect and build community. And my little humble brag is that my Fruition Council Mastermind is a beautiful place to do that if you are a woman entrepreneur. So feel free to slide into my DMs and reach out about that. Number four, you won't nail your pricing day one. You just won't. And that's okay. You don't have to get it right day one. You get to change and evolve your business, who your clients are, how much you charge them over time as you learn and grow. And number five, numbers change, but business fundamentals don't. And I love that Peter brought up that point. Like now he's playing the game at the multi-billion dollar level, but many of the questions that they're asking themselves and the fundamentals of what they're doing in business are very similar, if not the same, as what someone who is working towards their first six-figure year in their own business is doing. So thank you, as always, for tuning into the show. Thank you for liking, subscribing, sharing, leaving a review. You have made this a top 3% global podcast. I so appreciate it. And I will talk to you soon. Listeners like you have made this a top 3% global podcast. So thank you so much for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, share, and leave a review. I also love hearing listener feedback, so feel free to slide into my DMs on Instagram at mmakesmoney. If you would like to explore hiring me as your money healer and business mentor, hit the link in the show notes or head to explore.emilywilcox.com. Until next time, I'm sending you all the magic money vibes on your joyous path to millions.